The following is a co-production of and is jointly funded by the Weather Channel and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Tornadoes. Hurricanes. Flash floods. Each year, these natural disasters claim hundreds of victims. Early warning is the key to survival. Get it off those homes, Lord. Get it off those homes. At the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the top minds in the country are developing technology to buy you time. And extra time, even a few minutes, could save your life. are the most fascinating storms on Earth. Violent, erratic, and mysterious. Their unmistakable funnel clouds can be as beautiful as they are deadly. These powerful storms can appear out of nowhere and reach wind speeds of more than 300 miles an hour. They can last mere seconds or up to several hours. Tornadoes come in a range of intensities, but one thing is certain, they are extremely hard to predict. At the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Norman, Oklahoma, scientists from the National Severe Storms Laboratory, the Storm Prediction Center, and Weather Forecast Office are no strangers to tornadoes. These are the folks who helped develop Doppler weather radar, which revolutionized the way we look at storms. Even greater advances in radar are around the corner. The goal? Longer lead times, so that when a tornado strikes, you can get to safety. On the morning of May 3rd, 1999, the people of Oklahoma had no idea that one of the most destructive tornadoes in Oklahoma history would strike that day. The day begins much as any other, with a heads up from the Storm Prediction Center about the possibility of severe weather. May 3rd for us was a day that's like a lot of days in the Southern Plains. We knew there was a risk of severe thunderstorms and perhaps a few tornadoes. By midday, Doppler radar shows escalating storm activity. The National Weather Service sends out a tornado watch that is picked up by the local media. Okay. All right, storms continue to intensify. Just some quarter-sized hail being reported, but there is tornado watch in effect for a good part of southwestern, south, central, and central Oklahoma for the next several hours. No tornadoes at the moment, but uh, we'll be watching it for you. Realizing conditions are ripe for disaster, weather service forecasters track the potentially dangerous weather throughout the afternoon. Shortly after 4 o'clock, the situation takes a turn for the worse. The National Weather Service alerts media and government there is a high risk for severe storms. Hospital workers, police officers, and emergency managers brace themselves for the coming disaster. So you're feeling that, you know, it's game time, but you're also feeling, my gosh, it's my community, these are people I know. Shortly after 6 p.m., the tornado touches down southwest of Oklahoma City and keeps on going. The circulation is about six miles across. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Now, you folks, as you folks watch this, this thing now, as you watch this, keep in mind, oh, hey, many Christmas. We tried to give a blow-by-blow -blow description of where the storm was moving and what areas would be affected next. And then it got to Bridge Creek, and it was just kind of, because it went through the power lines, it was just kind of pow, 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 it was just those flashes. And, you know, I knew it had to be in a populated area. People had to be dying, because not everyone gets the word. Not everyone takes the proper safety precautions. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Right over the house, right over the woods. Just so don't come this way. Oh. Ah, look at it. At 6.55, just before the tornado strikes Oklahoma City, Gary England hears something from the National Weather Service that he's never heard before. The National Weather Service came out and said, tornado emergency. Now, that got everyone's attention. The tornado stays on the ground for an hour and a half 
annihilating everything in its path. You hear the wind picking up. Look at the fire. Look at the lightning down at the bottom. It must have touched. Look, it's moving north. Get in the house. Get in the house. Yeah. There'll be lightning and all kinds of stuff going all over. I still cannot get through the cell phone call Channel 9. I was already in there. She just barely got in there and closed the door and it hit. What did it sound like? <laughs> Fright plane. We could hear it just a roar. The tornado causes more than $1 billion in damage. More than 10,000 homes are damaged or destroyed. The president declares a state of emergency. The central Oklahoma tornado that day was rated F5. It's the most intense type of tornado that uh, you can experience. There are 44 fatalities in Oklahoma that day, but the death toll could have been far worse. Thanks to the early warning issued by the National Weather Service, many people make it to shelter in time. There was a survey taken in Oklahoma City after the storm of the actual storm victims. And I believe that the results of the survey were that 95% of those people that had been affected knew about the storm, which is a phenomenal warning rate. We are proud of uh, the way the warning system worked on the evening of May 3rd. Uh, we strive to be able to perform at that level all the time. And as technology and our understanding of tornadoes increases, we hope to be able to do an even better job in the future. That future means even earlier warnings, thanks to advances in radar technology. In 1992, a network of more than 150 NEXRAT radars became fully operational within NOAA. These sophisticated Doppler radars are now being upgraded with a technology called dual polarization. During the May 3, 1999 tornado, Doppler radars could only read horizontal signals. The upgrade means that the radar will also have an alternating vertical signal. Two signals translates into more accurate warnings. Snowflakes, for example, are wide, but if you turn them on the edge, they're much taller than they are wide. And so by using dual polarization, we can detect the shape of the things that are up in the clouds. And we can determine rain from snow, we can determine hail size, and knowing that, of course, helps improve warnings for what's going on at the surface. Dual pole technology also provides better estimates of rainfall, making for more accurate flood warnings and forecasts. The upgraded radar will be operational within the next few years. But what if NOAA scientists could build the ultimate weather radar? project so advanced, it's like trying to send a man to Mars. In Norman, Oklahoma, the National Severe Storms Laboratory, in collaboration with government partners, academia, and the private sector, is testing a $25 million weather radar prototype. Based on proven phased array technology, first applied by the U.S. Navy to track missiles. It will take 10 to 20 years to design and deploy this new technology. What we have right now is snapshots of what goes on in, in, in severe thunderstorms in clouds every five minutes. What we'll be able to do with phased array, it'll be more like a movie. Doug Forsyth from the NSSL leads the team in building and testing the first phased array radar dedicated to weather studies. We're going to learn about how to use the phased array system, and we believe that we're going to be able to show that you can improve warning time, lead time by uh, six to ten minutes. Scientists at NOAA expect phased array radar to dramatically enhance tornado warnings so that when a disaster like the May 3rd, 1999 tornado strikes, there will be fewer fatalities. Coming up, an invisible danger lurks in the atmosphere and threatens our children. What is it? Stay tuned. Forecast Earth is brought to you by AOL. Want a better... When wildfires rage out of control, the smoke extends far beyond the flames. Smoke lingers in the air, endangering people's lives even after the fires die out. Smoke is an obvious danger. You can see it, smell it, and feel it burn your lungs. It's human nature to protect yourself from it. I put my hands over it, like, just like this. When, the, when there's like a fire, there's smoke. Black clouds from disastrous wildfires get everyone's attention. 
but they're not the biggest threat to your air. Even more menacing is the pollution that we breathe in, day in, day out. Emissions from cars and factories are more damaging to our health because we live with them every day. I have trouble <clears throat> breathing. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm having trouble now. It's a beautiful day. People who live with bad air on a daily basis become complacent, and that's when a much greater danger exists. In Los Angeles, a city with some of the dirtiest air in the country, physician Dr. Lauren Clement travels to schools in a breath mobile to treat asthmatic children. How many sprays do you use? How many puffs? Mm, two times in the morning and then two times in the night. The breath mobile, conceived by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, helps kids who are most vulnerable to air pollutants. When children are treated correctly, uh, the asthma can be controlled in uh, the vast, vast majority of the cases. Like many children, 11-year-old Juan has asthma, the number one cause of school absence. Here we go. Big breath. No. Perfect. On a bad air quality day, asthma can mean a trip to the emergency room. I get scared because I'm all thinking about that I won't be able to breathe. And I can't sleep very good because I keep on thinking about that. It's imperative that the American public have information about hidden air quality hazards like ground level ozone. That's why NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is partnering with the EPA to keep you better informed. The reason NOAA is moving into the, to the air quality forecasting business is as we have talked to our constituents, they come across and tell us we need information about ozone levels. Air pollution is a silent killer that preys upon children, people with respiratory illnesses, and the elderly. I've had asthma since I was about 50 or 55. One of the natural progressions of aging is a decrease in lungs vital capacity. And because of that, obviously, air quality is going to have a huge effect. But even healthy adults are at risk. You breathe in the ozone, and it impacts on the surface of your lungs. It's often referred to as getting a sunburn in your lungs if, if the ozone concentrations are too high. Cities across the U.S. each have their own ozone issues. Toxic industrial factories located in the Northeast, to oil refineries in Houston, to smog-choked cities across the nation. Even rural areas are not immune, since pollutants can travel with the wind. And forecasting wind and weather is NOAA's expertise. NOAA scientists are working to improve the accuracy of air quality forecasting. You've got all the expertise in NOAA for doing these air quality forecasting models. You've got EPA's history and the science of air quality. So bringing those two together is, is going to make a great team. Without numerical weather modeling, we would not be able to issue around the United States these ozone forecasts. What has to be done to understand what's going on in the atmosphere is so complex that humans just can't assimilate it all in their, in, in their minds, so you have to turn to computers. But with NOAA's new air quality forecast guidance, people like Juan will have better information to help limit their exposure to poor air quality. So the public may or may not see the model itself, but they'll see the model interpreted for them by their TV or radio forecast. Using a color-coded scale, the air quality index alerts you when the air is particularly dangerous. We are seeing some problems. The ozone levels will be high in the afternoon hours. If you have a compromised respiratory system, you should pay attention to the forecast. And if the forecasts are, are forecasting unhealthy for sensitive groups, which is code orange, or unhealthy, which is code red, you should take actions to prevent your exposure to ozone. One of the most important advances in air quality forecasting is getting detailed forecast guidance out in real time. What we're trying to do is be proactive, get some information out there quickly so that folks can make decisions before something happens, before an air quality problem is triggered. So it's going to keep people more healthy by letting them make smart decisions. On days with bad air quality, we encourage the residents to stay in. And we provide activities inside that will keep them inside. When the public knows the danger ahead of time, they can take precautions on a bad air day. Stay indoors, limit exercise, and turn on an air conditioner. For 
a population at risk, these safety measures are necessary, but not always fun. It's not fair that when I run around, I can't breathe because I really like playing around. When the saints go Up, Noah assembles their own weather army. Their Each day, over 10,000 volunteers from all 50 states venture outdoors to observe and record weather. These volunteers know that accurate weather records are crucial to science. They provide an invaluable service and take pride in creating a precious historical record. They love it. And just like anything, if you love something, you have tremendous interest in it, you're going to continue to do it. But I got enthused over this thing 50-odd years ago. And somehow or other, I've had other enthusiasms which have faded, but this one hasn't. It, it isn't just that I, I have to do it, it's that I want to do it. And I, I look forward to it. The volunteers make up a network called COOP, the Cooperative Observer Program, founded by NOAA's National Weather Service. Co-op functions today much like it has since it first began in the late 1800s. But that's about to change. By blending new technology with the tried and true capabilities of the co-op volunteers, NOAA will be able to collect and process weather records much faster. The measurements are organized and distributed to people who need the data, like NOAA scientists faced with the daunting task of researching climate changes. It is the input on which climate research starts out with. So without, the, without that data, the, the, there's not much research to be done. Farmers who rely on soil reports to help grow the food we eat. Forecasters who use the data to alert us of dangerous weather events. It's just a couple of yardsticks and thermometers, but that data is used by the meteorologists to, to predict severe weather events and that can help protect life and property and save money helping power plants estimate the public's need for energy francis donovan has been getting up early every day for 52 years braving new england snowstorms biting temperatures and even hurricanes to collect data i'd like to stay inside but it has to be done no matter what the weather the wind the rain or anything is so it gets done I do have capability in the house to read all of this, but I don't do it. I come out and do it here. This is the actual weather service operation, and this is what you do. Francis gathers measurements of temperature, wind, snow, and rainfall. Roughly a tenth. And 10 inches of snow is one inch of water. So we're just about on the button. Then calls his report into the local weather forecast office. The uh, max is 19. Min is minus two. Current temperature is three. Okay, thank you, Francis. You're welcome. Bye. Francis's job is about to get easier as the co-op program modernizes. Some of the information will be collected and submitted electronically. The National Weather Service office in Taunton, Massachusetts, is the first on the scene with the new technology. This is our prototype in this instrumentation. This measures wind speed, wind direction. Over here we have the thermometer, obviously measuring temperature. This antenna will shoot the data over to our office and it's on the internet within, uh, within 15 minutes. Plans are in the works to have 8,000 of these systems up and running throughout the nation in the next eight to 10 years. This advanced technology does not mean that the co-op observers will be out of a job. The co-op person is still a vital part of the program because he'll be measuring the snow and the density. And this automated system cannot do that. Volunteers like Francis will still be spending mornings in the chilling New England temperatures. So I'll adapt to any changes they want to make. The co-op observers will remain the keystone of weather recording. Mother Nature is probably the best mother that any of, any of us have ever had. It's a, it's a constant mother, that's for sure. And it changes, like mothers do, and it has its good moments and its bad. But generally... From severe storms that threaten millions of people, to hidden health hazards in the air, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration alerts us of potential danger. And when it comes to protecting life and property, there is nothing more important than an early warning.
every minute we can gain in getting knowledge to the forecaster on whether to put out a warning is invaluable. To improve lead times, scientists at NOAA work to remain at the forefront of technology. Uh, NOAA is a science-based service organization. We have a range of technologies from relatively simple to quite complex. So NOAA must remain technologically aware um, and must support a robust research program to help move technology forward. The ultimate challenge? Earlier storm predictions and faster warnings. Warnings that can save your life. This has been a co-production of and is jointly funded by the Weather Channel and the Environmental Protection Agency.